like I said, today we're going to talk about horse manure management. And so how it's going to work is I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about production and volume, why that's important to know. Um, from there, we're going to roll into stacking areas and site selection. I'll talk a little bit about composting. Um, then Paige is going to take over and talk about manure weed management. And then Rachel will take over and talk about manure parasite management. And then I will end with, um, how do you work with a custom manure hauler? What is a custom manure hauler? And then some at-home spreading options. So that's the plan for today. We have a lot to roll through, but we will get it done. Okay, so just as a general idea of who is here um, and why we had you guys put your zip codes in so we can kind of map out where uh, our folks are coming from. And so the majority are from North Dakota, so welcome. NDSU Extension is glad you're here. Uh, we do have some participants from other parts of the U.S. though too, and then we did have some folks register from Germany, Australia, and Argentina, um, and then there was a couple uh, postal codes that were different um, that we weren't sure where they were from, and so they were either accidentally typed in wrong or um, Google just doesn't recognize that, but you're from somewhere, so if you want to put that in the chat pod, we'd be, uh, we'd be glad to look at that. So here's where everyone's from, just so you have an idea. And more so, this is for Rachel and Paige, so we have an idea of who's here today, and maybe even you guys. So number of horses per participant. I had you guys put this in as well, because uh, I was curious um, who we're looking at. And so um, the numbers that are in the yellow, uh, so here the numbers that are in the yellow are the number of uh, people and our participants, and then the number of horses is along the bottom. And so you can see then that uh, six people had zero horses. And so um, some of you wrote in the comments then uh, on why that might be. And most often it was um, you ride horses for other people, uh, you ride horses for a class you're taking, you're thinking of getting a horse, um, or you're just interested. You work with people that have horses and you're just really interested to hear what we have to say today. Um, but you can see though that the most common number here is two horses. So 24 uh, of our participants have two horses. Uh, three and five would be the next most common uh, numbers for horses. So a lot of folks have less than 10 horses that are on here today. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the, the why of this. Why manage manure? Why is Mary so interested in this? Managing manure, um, it contains a lot of valuable nutrients, and so these plants, um, plants can use these nutrients, but if we give them too much or we give it to them at the wrong time, uh, we're wasting the nutrients, but then also we're potentially causing pollution issues. So improper manure storage um, and land application, which sometimes happens when we have livestock and we're not sure how much manure they produce or what we're going to do with that manure, can cause excess soil nutrients. So that's basically we're polluting the soil with extra nutrients. Um, that sometimes leads to surface runoff, which can lead to algal blooms like you see in the picture. Um, leachate, so that's uh, going down through the soil profile, and then water contaminated with manure. And so those are reasons that I work with manure. Those are reasons that I want you to manage your manure. Um, but also some things that you might consider Maybe more important, uh, flies. So management considerations for manure for you might be something like flies, um, bacteria and pathogens, rodents, weed seeds, which we'll talk about, internal parasites, which we'll talk about, and odors. And so uh, why would odors be important? Your neighbor probably, especially if you're in an urban area, does not appreciate your manure pile. And so how can we handle some of those issues? So we're going to talk about the majority of this. Uh, these today as we go through. And the first thing we're gonna start out with is production. So I borrowed these numbers from Michigan State University's extension program. Uh, they actually had a webinar yesterday. And so I'm gonna post, if they recorded that, I'm gonna post their link. And so you can, um, maybe their numbers are more appropriate for where you're at in the country. And, and so you can grab both of our webinars and use all of the information. So why do we care about production? Okay, well, let's just walk through these first. If you're thinking too much math for noon on a Wednesday, I agree. Uh, but manure, produ manure produced per horse per month. So we have a thousand pound horse. 
they're gonna make about 50 pounds of manure uh, and urine a day. So we take that, by 30 days, we have about 1,500 pounds of product. And then if you're um, bedding with a shaving or you're doing shavings in your um, stall, so if you have a stalled horse, then you're gonna have around 1,950 pounds of total, hor uh, total manure per horse per month. And so um, if you do the math on that, so 1,900 is pretty close to 2,000, which is a ton. So 2,000 pounds equals one ton uh, times 12 months is 24,000 pounds or 12 tons of manure per year. <clears throat> Sounds like a lot. Now we're gonna look at volume. And you might be thinking, we just did all the math. Okay, and so there are different ways to look at it. There's tons and then there's volume. And you can, I'm not gonna go through these numbers here, but basically um, you can have, uh, let's see. So if you have uh, 2,000 pounds of manure per horse per month, that can equal 99 total cubic feet um, per horse per month. And so these volume, both volume and pounds, that's gonna come in important later as we're going through it. So I just wanted to give you some initial, what is our production? And why is that important? And you're gonna see why that's important as we go through this presentation today. Okay, so first we need to talk about manure stacking or stockpiling. Depending on where you're at in the country, uh, you will call it different things. You'll call it manure stacking or you'll call it manure stockpiling. Basically, it's the same thing. So short-term manure stockpiles, and these guidelines are from North Dakota. Every state is different. And so, um, I give North Dakota guidelines because that's where the majority of our participants are coming from today. However, if you do have um, some questions about this, you can easily just call your regulatory agency in your state and they should be able to tell you what the guidelines are. So a short term uh, manure stockpiles in North Dakota, manure may not be stockpiled for more than nine months at a time and the same location cannot be used from year to year versus a permanent manure stockpile in North Dakota can be, uh, you can stack manure there for more than nine months at a time. And this typically involves some kind of uh, soil investigation and regulatory oversight. So they wanna make sure that you can use that pile or that ground every year. So that site will be your stockpiling area every single year. But they have to make sure first what kind of soil you have there, where that's going so that we're not leaching any nutrients into the soil. Okay, so how do we pick an area for stockpiling? And most of us are doing stockpiling on the, the short term. So we're doing it uh, like a nine month or less. And so um, no matter what, sandy soils have rapid permeability. And so what does that mean? It means that um, the, the water with the nutrients that are dissolved in there can quickly go through the soil profile. So that's why we, wanna, we want to use more of a clay type soil. And in North Dakota, we have a lot of areas that have clay soils. And so that's a, that's a benefit for us. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're using a clay soil and then depth to groundwater and location to surface water. So what is your groundwater table? And what is, like, where are your streams and your uh, rivers, your lakes? Where are those located relative to where you wanna stockpile your manure? Okay, no matter if you're doing short-term or long-term, it does not matter. Manure stockpiles may not be located in gravel pits or other excavations. So if you see an area and you're like, well, I can't use that for anything else, nobody uses it for anything else, I'll put my manure there. Don't do that uh, because it's probably not being used for something for a reason. Very likely if it's a pit, it's going to become inundated with water, especially uh, after the, the fall we had last year here in North Dakota and pretty much throughout the country, a lot of rain and then a plenty snow this winter and some quick uh, thawing this spring, we have a lot of water sitting around. And so a lot of those areas, those pits, um, holes are being filled in. We don't want to um, put manure along streams or lakes, anything that's surface water, or that's gonna run to surface water. Um, and then within 50 feet of a private well or 100 feet of a public well, and then some areas, so in North Dakota it's not required, but you can cover your manure uh, with a plastic or a tarp if you want to. That can help to reduce the, the odors and the fly issues. Um, but of course here with the wind that we've been experiencing today, I look out my window of my home office thinking, it's so beautiful out today because there's no wind. 
uh, but the last couple days it would have been kind of hard to keep that tarp down and so uh, in some states it is required that manure stockpiles are covered so again you just go to your state and figure out what those regulatory requirements are okay so one way of managing these nutrients or managing these issues is composting and i like to talk about composting we could talk about it all day long. This could be a whole webinar just on composting, uh, but we're not going to do that. So what's going to happen is I'm just going to glaze over composting real quick. Um, and then if you have further questions on that, you can always ask me. And again, I'm going to post a couple of resources to go with this webinar. And one of them is going to be our composting uh, publication that really spells out how to do these things. So the benefits of composting, why do I like it so much? <clears throat> Especially for a horse operation, uh, horse manure comes out almost perfect. Uh, there's a lot of people, it, it's so easy to use. Uh, and so we wanna compost that. Composting horse manure is easy. It's one of the easier products I think that we can compost. But why compost? Uh, we can get rid of our weed seeds. We can get rid of our pathogens. We can lower the nutrient loss and we can increase nutrient stability. So I was talking earlier with the algal bloom picture and the, how some of our um, nutrients can leach throughout the soil profile. Uh, we can reduce some of that by composting because it changes the form of nitrogen that's available or that's there. So it doesn't change the amount, it changes the form. And then of course, weed seeds and pathogens go down. That's always a benefit. Okay, there we go. Another thing that might be more intriguing to you is a reduction in flies or a reduction in insects in general. So flies I know is a big one for horse owners and so flies breed when spring temperatures get above 65, which we just hit, I think we're just hitting this week. Uh, Western North Dakota probably hit it on like Monday. Yesterday here, not quite. Uh, but pretty soon we're gonna have some flies. And so you can see here it says um, they lay their eggs on the top couple inches of moist manure and then they hatch in as little as seven days. And so with manure compost, because we're constantly turning it, we can constantly disrupt that flow. We can disrupt their life cycle and potentially uh, lessen the amount of flies we have. So something else to keep in mind with composting. Okay, so composting, what is it? It's a mixture of organic residues. You pile them, you mix them, you moisten them, and they go through decomposition. So the result is going to be a crumbly, you can see in the picture here, a crumbly, low odor, a stable, nutrient-rich amendment. So basically what that means is we have changed the form, like I said earlier, of the nitrogen that's there. We've lowered the odor, so there should be minimal odor. Um, we've properly brought it up to temp, so we've killed the weed seeds and pathogens. And one of the bigger things for maybe you guys is we've reduced the volume. So we reduced the volume that's there by about 50%. So that's a lot, 50% less product there. Okay, again, that'll come in important later. So here's some potential uh, structures. Now keep in mind, you don't need a structure to compost, uh, but it is something that some people do ask about. So uh, you can see here in the upper left, there's a, a pallet um, structure. And that's something that's simple to put together. It takes some T-posts, some wire, and some pallets. Um, and then you can see one that's more of an engineered type um, product. And so that would be something that has a, um, like either a clay base or a concrete base, concrete pad, um, and something to compost up against. And then down in the lower left, there's more of a bin system. And so those are pretty common, especially at stables. Um, and then over on the lower right, is a kind of a homemade type bin system where this person made this little bin to make it work for them. Again, you don't need a structure to compost. You can just put your manure in a windrow or a pile and turn it, uh, and that will suffice. But I know folks do like to see structure whenever we talk about compost. Another thought is potentially doing a community compost project. And so this is a picture of a, uh, this was actually taken out of stable. And so this is a, basically it's a dumpster. It's a big dumpster with a greenhouse top on it. And then on the inside, you can see that there's a, an auger. And so this auger in here then goes back and forth 
and it goes and mixes up and down as well. And so what was happening is they were putting the compost or the fresh manure in one side, and then after a certain amount of time, it goes through the process and comes out the other end of this dumpster as a completed product. Um, and if you'll believe it, they were using this product as bedding reuse at this horse stable. So what they were doing is composting manure and then using that composted product as bedding reuse. Now you might think, holy smokes for pathogens and potential issues, but they trusted the process enough and they had done it enough and managed it properly to know they were killing pathogens that it wasn't a concern to them. So um, this is probably not something you do by yourself. Um, probably a little expensive just if you own a couple horses, but as a community, it might be something to look into. Okay, back to the basics of composting. So what do we need? We need carbon and nitrogen. Those are two of the very first things that we need to talk about, carbon and nitrogen. Uh, like I said earlier, horse manure comes out, it's almost right. So we want uh, 40 to one. So 40 parts carbon, one part nitrogen is, is what we like. Uh, so 20 to one to 40 to one, somewhere in there. So we have this horse manure product and we have some extra bedding mixed in with it typically. And so that's a carbon source. And so we have that all mixed in and, and ready. And then you can see in this uh, top picture here how we have the, we just uh, use windrows. So you can use a windrow or a, um, a pile. So you pile it. We want to pile it so that it can maintain a temperature so it can get up to temp. <clears throat> and so when we're piling it, we're looking at the moisture content of that product. So what is the moisture content of your current manure product? We want ours in a compost, if we want our compost to properly work, to be anywhere from 40 to 65% uh, moisture. And so that means we like an average of 50%. So 50% is right in the middle. Uh, we can do the wet rag test or the squeeze test. And so that's what they're actually doing in this upper right picture is they're squeezing uh, to see what that moisture is. And so what you do is you put on a glove, you stick your hand in, you pull out some manure and you squeeze. If water comes running out of your glove, you have too much water. We're over 50% likely. If you let it go, it crumbles in your hand. Very likely you have less than 50%, but if it kind of stays together, there's a little bit of water on your glove after you drop the manure off, uh, there's, you know, there's a little bit there, but it's not pooling, it's not running out, you're probably at 50% and that's good. So if you're under that, what can you do? You can add water. If you're over that, what can you do? We can add some more products, some more carbon source to that, um, as long as we're not going over the 40 to one so that we're wrecking our carbon to nitrogen ratio. Okay, temperature. Ideally, we want 131 degrees for 15 days, but nobody works in ideals, and so we like a range. So 130 to 160 degrees is where I like to keep our compost. We're killing stuff at that temp, but we're killing the bad stuff. If we go over 160 degrees, we're pretty much killing everything. And if we go under that, we're really not doing much of anything. It's still composting, but it's not killing stuff. It's just a very slow process. We, it's too cold. We've slowed everything down. And so ideally, uh, we like it between the 130 and 160 range. And you can buy these thermometers um, online, uh, anywhere from 35 to $70, depending on what you're looking for. Okay, now I've been talking about mixing it. We have to mix it. And why do we do that? We mix it to make sure first we have a, um, a uniform product. And so we want everything to be uniform and mixed together well. But then also as we're mixing it, we're oxygenating. And so I said a 50% of that pore space should be water. Well, the other 50% then needs to be air. And so that means that our bacteria, our, path our uh, microbes that are working in there, they really like to breathe. And so 50% of that pore space needs to be um, water for, or needs to be air for them so they can breathe. So how do we mix it? Uh, so a payloader. That might be really big for your operation, and it depends. Maybe you're one of them that has the 25 horses. You use a payloader, you use a front end loader to feed, you use a skid steer. Um, those are things that are, are really easy for you to get, and that's okay. If you have them, use them. Um, maybe you have a turner, like that's in this picture here. So this is a, a compost turner. Very likely you don't, they're quite expensive, um, but it might be one of those community projects you could look at or your local soil conservation district or soil and water conservation district may have something like this. 
And so make sure that as you're looking around, looking for options, you check them out. But very likely, most of us are gonna be using either a skid steer or a pitchfork. And that works. That is totally fine. I don't want you to not compost because you don't have the biggest and best products. We don't need the biggest and best. We just need what you have on your farm. Okay, so uh, mixing helps maintain the temperature. So we talked about the temp uh, and where it needs to stay and, and the oxygen. And so we, we need to mix it to put some oxygen back in the pile, but then we also need to mix it to make sure that uh, that we're maintaining a temperature as it cools down. We're gonna mix everything up again and we're gonna displace um, the, the pieces and we're gonna change the surface area and we're gonna bring that back together and then that's going to allow the temp to spike again. And so that's what we want is we want our temperature to go up. And the best way to do that is to make sure that if everything else is correct and we have not mixed the pile, that's probably gonna be the best thing that we can do. Okay, when is it done? So we've turned the pile, we've tempted it, we know what the moisture is, we knew what the C to N going in was, everything is great, but Mary, it will not come up to temp. Okay, maybe it's done. And you're gonna ask me, when is that? Well, that's gonna depend on your operation and your management style. So um, some folks get really excited and they turn every time that thing goes over 160 degrees, they're watching it with a thermometer, they're out there, and then I have some folks that put it on the calendar. And every 10 to 14 days correlates to the temperature uh, spikes that we should get. And so they're going by, by a calendar. So theirs might be a little longer, theirs might take a little longer. Also, if you're adding product constantly to that pile and turning it, you're never really gonna be done until you stop adding product to that one specific pile or that one bin and start a new bin. If you're constantly adding something fresh and you're mixing it in with the old stuff, you potentially are just keeping that process going, which is fine. It's just going to take longer. So it just depends on your situation, what you're going for, and what your management style is. Okay, so now what? It's, uh, we've said it's come to temp. Um, we've turned it. We've mixed it. We've done all the things right. And now it's no longer rising and we think it's done. Okay, so now we let it set. We let it set and we let it cure. And basically what we're doing is we're letting those microbes that are really excited, they were really excited. They really like their job of breaking down that material. But they need to chill out a little bit. Okay, and so we just let them chill out in the pile. Uh, we let the pile cure. We let it reach ambient temperature. So that means like the air around us. And uh, then we can use it. And we use it at agronomic rates. Uh, so nutrient considerations, we have a, a stable source. The only thing to keep in mind, and this is more so if folks are really using it as a fertilizer and they're used to using a fertilizer, uh, it's going to be a different, availability is going to be different than it was in a fresh manure. And so compost in a, or a nitrogen in a fresh manure, North Dakota is about 50% available. In our compost, it's about 20% available. Still a good product, just a different product. Okay, so before I keep going, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to turn it over to Paige. Paige is going to talk to you about reducing weed problems. So Paige Brumman is our uh, extension agent in, um, in Ward County. And I think I just stopped the screen share. So I will fix that. One second. There we go. While you're doing that, Mary, there's a question in the Q&A. Um, okay. The dumpster structure, is that a DIY project? Or are there plans or contractors for that sort of project? I'm wondering if that's a question for the community. Um, the community composting? Yeah. So uh, my thoughts on that was that was actually in Washington. Uh, where that happened, uh, Washington State, where we saw that. And so there's actually a company that does that. Um, and so I could look for that information if, if people are interested. And um, I can go ahead and, and get that information to them. Okay, with that, I'm going to let Paige take over and I messed her all up because I stopped the screen share. So 
Let's see if I can just get her caught up here. Okay. So Paige Brumman again is from our Ward County Extension Office. Um, she's one of our extension agents in Ag and Natural Resources and, uh, and really likes working mm -hmm. with horses. So I asked her to come and talk about weed problems in manure. All right, thanks Mary. So we talked about how important temperature is and you know, uh, weed seeds consumed by the horse will germinate and produce more weeds if not properly composted. I want you to look at this slide here and it kind of shows that if that temperature reaches 140 degrees in your compost pile, that most of our weeds are gonna be killed in one to three hours. So um, something to keep in mind though is that the entire pile isn't gonna be at the same temperature all at the same time. And that's where it goes back to properly composting and turning that pile so that the outside of the pile ends up inside, reaches the temperature and kills those weed seeds. So again, um, most of the weed seeds will be able to be killed if you reach the correct temperatures. Mary, I am not able to advance. Can you go ahead and do that? Oh. All right, thank you. So even if you properly compost, you go and you spread that compost, there still may be a few weeds, seeds that escape that did not get killed, even though the mass majority will. Um, at that point, you have a few different options to control those weeds that did germinate. A mechanical option would be mowing. So go ahead and mow your, your pastures after you graze them, preferably, or should be, before those weeds produce a seed head that will be viable to the next weed population. A cultural method to control weeds will be maintaining a thick, healthy, dense pasture so that the weeds are outcompeted by the desirable plants. And that can be done through overseeding and proper grazing management. Horses are pretty tough on grasses and pastures. They really like to chew them down and then that provides a good opportunity for weeds to come in and grow. So managing those pastures to minimize the weeds competing with the grasses is another option. And then a third option is chemical control, and that'd be using herbicides to uh, control the weeds. So the first step is you need to know what weeds you have in order to select the proper herbicides. Um, you're going to want to apply those at the correct time. It's not as effective to apply herbicides to mature, tall, three, four foot tall weeds. Um, it's best to control them when they're just a few inches in height. And then you want to apply them at the correct rate as well. And these are things that are going to be on the label of your herbicide product. And always remember to follow that label. Um, that label is the law. If you need assistance with identifying what weeds they are and selecting what herbicides will be able to con effectively control them, you can certainly contact your county extension agent. Okay. Um, if you're using herbicides to control weeds and horses are consuming the pasture or the hay on the fields that have been sprayed, you need to be aware that some of the herbicides out there have herbicide carryover and they remain effective and active even in that manure and that compost. So um, one option would be to spread that compost back onto the pastures or the hay fields to minimize killing any undesirable uh, plants such as your vegetable garden or your shrubs or your trees. Um, be aware that this is a issue for some herbicides that you may apply. So for instance, these are some of the active ingredients that can be found in hay and, and grass clippings and these herbicides may be applied on pastures. So clopyrrolid, uh, fluoxapyr, picolaram, and triclopyr are some of the active ingredients that do persist in compost and manure. And then I want to uh, draw your attention to the North Dakota Weed Control Guide. This is a good resource for finding ways to control uh, products that can be used to control certain weeds in rangeland. So that is a good resource for North Dakota people. And then here's kind of an at-home way to see if there's herbicide carryover in your compost or your manure. Because even if you didn't apply any herbicides on your pasture, if you're purchasing hay, you don't really know what's being used. Uh, so keep that in mind. But here's an at-home test. You can fill a few pots with some potting soil mixture and your compost mixture at about a two to one ratio of your manure compost and then a commercial potting mix. Go ahead and, and also have a control of just plain potting mix pots. 
plant some peas or bean seeds in those pots, water them until they grow and have their first three true leaves. And then at that time, you should be able to identify if they look normal and healthy, it's likely that you don't have a high concentration of persistent herbicides in that compost. If the leaves are, are cupped and curled and the plant doesn't look so healthy, it, it's possible that there is some persistent herbicides in there. Uh, keep in mind that some of these can stick around for, you know, maybe 30 days, whereas some of these can stick around for years, you know, three, four years. So keep that in mind. Also, the, the results for this at-home test are only going to be as good as your sample that you took. So if you just grabbed one or two handfuls from your compost pile, that might not be as ideal as going and taking four or five or six or ten samples across your pile, mixing them in a bucket and, and trying to get a good representative sample. All right, I believe that is it for me. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Rachel Wald. She's the McHenry County Extension Agent, and she's gonna talk about how to manage parasites in your manure and compost. Okay, and Paige, can you give Rachel control? I just gave up control, so I think wow. Mary, now you're able to uh, give her control of the screen. Okay. okay. So what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the equine parasites that we see in our region um, in North Dakota. So most common parasites are what I have listed here. Um, and, and I realize as we go further south, there are more. Um, and these are internal parasites and not necessarily external parasites as well. I know Mary had talked about flies and other issues like that. I do have bots on there, which comes from a fly, but these are kind of our most common internal parasites. And I think everybody kind of knows the symptoms, weight loss, condition, you know, anemia, colic, uh, rough, poor rough coat. So you're going to see um, a lot of that coming around if you have any issues with, with parasites. Um, I actually don't have control yet. Oh, there it is. Okay, never mind. All right. So I wanted to talk kind of some management practices to reduce internal parasites. Talking about removing manure daily from the stalls, run-ins, um, and weekly from pastures and paddocks. Make sure uh, those pastures and paddocks are well drained and not overpopulated. Uh, composting manure rather than spreading it on those fields also gets rid of those, those parasite eggs and larvae. After a period of time, you make sure to get it hot enough. Uh, use a feeder for hay and grain and avoid feeding on the ground. Also talking about implementing some fly control programs. I, I know a lot of people that have horses in the area and usually they do have a fly control program in effect, um, whether it be those fly bags or fly predators or regular use of, um, of an insecticide on their horse, uh, keeping water trough and feed bins clean so that there's no way for them to reproduce via water. Routinely examining horses for telltale signs of, of infestation, you know, that scrubby looking tail or even you seeing botfly eggs on the legs, um, poor thrifty coat. Establishing a parasite prevention and monitoring program with your veterinarian is the next step to really look forward to. Um, they have gone from regular deworming cycles to testing the feces for parasites and then recommending recommending a parasite control program uh, based off of what their their parasite load is. Um, so that's really nice because then you can you can really look at at getting your horse cleaned out. Um, this will not get everything but it will definitely reduce the amount of parasites that you will see in your horses. This may include regular manure checks. Um, so most of the time when we see transmission or when the horse gets a, a parasite, it's, it's called a fecal oral transmission. So they poop on the ground and they obviously eat from the ground so that either from poop or from soil, they're gonna pick it up and it'll go straight into their mouth and then right down into the digestive system. Um, and then in the case of bot flies, it's a direct ingestion of the eggs off of the legs. Um, so there's a couple of different different things going on here and there's there's also a couple other ways that transmission happens but 
with that parasite life cycle, you're seeing that egg or larval stage, the first one, um, it's either in the soil or in the feces, they pick it up through their mouth um, and it, the life cycle begins in the mouth, goes down into the intestine, and that's where, where that egg or that larval starts to develop. And that can last anywhere from six months to two years in your horse. And that's why getting that deworming done with a power pack or, or whatever your, your veterinarian recommends is important. Um, so that larval stage starts there, it gets to become an adult and then it expels eggs and it goes back back through the feces and back into the environment just like we talked about. That's why this is important to, to manage all of that, to make sure that all of the, the eggs that are expelled or, or most of the eggs that are expelled are taken care of through proper management of that, of that manure. Um, a couple of resources that I went through, American Veterinary Medical Association and then the uh, American Association of Equine Practitioners is where I found a lot of really good information on this. Um, and then talking to your regular veterinarian about testing, testing that feces. I know this time of year I usually do a, what I call a teeth and sheath exam and they're there already so get a fecal sample because it's probably in the trailer before you even leave the yard. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Paige and Rachel. So I will take back over here and we'll talk just a little bit more about manure um, as far as disposal options go. And so off-farm manure disposal, um, I had said earlier about potentially working with a community project and um, that's on here again. So it could be some kind of community compost project, um, maybe working with your local soil conservation districts. Maybe you uh, engage them a little bit and ask them, hey, you know, how can we work together? Do you have a compost turner? Do you have a, a site that we could bring it all to? And uh, we could have a community compost um, composting area. Local vegetable growers and uh, CSA, so community supported egg programs, they like horse manure as a fertilizer. Of course, we're going to want to keep in mind what Paige talked about with uh, potential herbicide carryover and how that might be an issue. And so that's just something to be very upfront about if you are going to give this product to a local grower. Um, what, you know, what was uh, your hay or your bedding sprayed with uh, and what might be the potential risks there. Some landfills accept manure. So that is another option. And if you're looking for an off-farm manure disposal, something I'm most familiar with is my work with our custom manure haulers in North Dakota. And so there's a, a lot of states and several of you, before I turn my chat pod off, um, as you were coming on when I was looking at it, several of the states that are on here do have uh, custom manure hauler associations or groups um, that, uh, so you could access them through your extension agents um, or extension um, specialists extension um, service in your state. And so um, here in North Dakota, I work with a group, mostly these are big haulers, right? So they work with um, our cattle guys. Uh, cattle are the biggest livestock industry in North Dakota. And so they're gonna have equipment that matches or meets those needs. However, um, in my meetings with them and in our annual meeting, we just talked a couple months ago, <coughs> excuse me, about working with equine owners. How can we work with horse folks that have manure and they wanna get rid of it? Will they work with you? So here's a few things to keep in mind. Okay, how much manure do you have to spread? And I ask you that, and this is where our production numbers from way in the beginning come from. Why was Mary talking about tons and cubic feet and all those things? Because it's gonna come in so important because when you call a manure hauler, um, most of these guys are based in rural areas, and so they're, especially if you're an urban horse owner, they're going to have to come to you, uh, which is a little bit different than maybe what they're used to as far as working with other rural um, cattle folks. And so um, how much manure do you have to spread? They need to know that because of the size and type of equipment and the expense of that equipment that they're bringing, uh, going to bring to your operation. They have to know how much. Do they need four trucks or one? Do they need um, a bobcat or a, a, a payloader? Like what kind of equipment are they needing? Uh, so that is something. So how much do you have to spread? Um, where are they spreading it? So this is your responsibility as a horse owner 
um, and, and the owner then of that manure to figure out where these custom guys are going to go with this manure. It is not their job. Uh, so when you call them and say, I have a load of manure to spread, they're assuming that you have either the land to spread it on or you have already talked to your local um, farmer, rancher, neighbors, and they've said, yep, yeah, you can spread here, no problem. Um, because it's not their job to, to go and look that information up for you. So two things, how much do you have to spread and where the heck are we going to put it? Okay, so those are two things you're going to have to know right away. The other thing is to keep in mind is can they get their manure um, equipment into your storage area? And if they can't right now, maybe that's something to keep in mind when you're picking a stacking area is what kind of equipment can get into this area? Um, how can I best place this so that it works for me bringing this manure out and storing it, but also for somebody who's going to potentially be hauling it off? And then um, can you pay them? And I say, can you pay them? Because first, um, we pay our farriers and we pay our vet supplies. And so we, we do have to pay these guys coming to do this work. It's big equipment, it's expensive to run. And so I would say a minimum in North Dakota, at least, a minimum of $500 is something that you're easily gonna be looking at. Um, and we have to keep in mind that they have um, employees to pay. And so they do like to be paid at the end of the day when they're done with their job. So what does their equipment look like? Okay, so here's just some examples. Uh, this picture was actually taken at the North American Manure Expo uh, when we were getting ready for our solid demonstrations, but I wanted to put it up there because you can see a variety of spreaders. You can see vertical spreaders, you can see horizontal spreaders, you can see big spreaders, but almost all of these spreaders are pulled by a tractor. So will that big tractor and that big spreader fit into your stacking area where you have that manure currently? Or will they be able to get a, a skid steer or a tractor? Most likely a lot of these guys are using payloaders. Will they be able to get that payloader in there to clean that manure out? Um, these guys aren't bringing pitchforks to pitch the manure for you. That is your job to have that area stacked up and ready so they can come in, scoop it out, put it in the low, into the spreader and go. So here's what some would look like. Mostly though in North Dakota, this is what our trucks look like. So we don't necessarily, we do have some haulers that pull those tractors like you just saw, but the majority of the guys here are actually gonna have truck mounted spreaders. So will these truck mounted spreaders, uh, and then here's a, a payloader, and here's another payloader, will those payloaders fit into the area where you're currently stacking that manure? And if not, can you move it to a different location to uh, make it accessible to them? Or can several of you stack in one certain area together? Can all of you as a community stack so when they come, you guys can spread um, as a community instead? And then I put this picture over here and, and I'm thinking that you guys are pretty good about making sure your horses aren't eating. Um, if you're putting out uh, hay or you know some kind of bedding, something like that, they're, they're not, um, they don't have net wrap or, or twine on them. But if they do, it's just something else to keep in mind that the haulers do charge for twine cutting. Um, because as you can see in the picture here, they do get uh, that twine wraps really nicely around the beaters. Uh, so it almost never ends up in the field, but it almost always ends up wrapped around the beaters. And that messes with the efficiency of that piece of equipment. And so uh, they have to go through then at the end of every day. And sometimes if it's uh, a lot, like this picture is here, uh, they actually have to go through every few loads and cut that twine off, which takes a lot of time and some pretty good effort. And so um, they do charge for that as well. Okay, so those were all off-farm disposal options. Now, at-home spreading options. You're thinking, I don't want to pay someone to do it. I want to spread it myself. It seems interesting to me. Maybe I should do this. Okay, so there are some at-home spreading options as well. Um, most of these spreaders are going to be small. Uh, they're pool type. They're ground-driven. So they're just a small pull, ground-driven spreader. Most of the time they're pulled by um, a four-wheeler, some kind of ATV, like maybe a side-by-side, -side, um, a lawnmower. Some, I was looking last week and there were some people that said, we just retrofit them and we use, we use our horse. Our horse pulls the spreader. And so um, here's some examples. And of course, we don't recommend any of these um, examples over any others. These are just some ones that I did a quick internet search last week and, and some options that came up. 
So some things to keep in mind, some words that really stood out to me as I was going through and doing my research last week. How many head do you have? How many horses do you have? And how often are you planning on spreading? That's going to help you determine what size of these at-home spreaders you're gonna want. Um, do you have the ground to put it on? Do you have the ability to have that proper rotation to do that? Uh, what, what's the capacity of your spreader? Um, so how many horses do you have? Again, how often are you planning on spreading? And so um, you're going to need to know that for capacity. And when I say capacity, for these smaller at-home spreaders, it can be either bushels or cubic feet. What? Now we're talking about bushels too? So we talked earlier about cubic feet and we talked about tons, but I didn't say anything about bushels. And so um, I do have a slide in here that, that will talk just a little bit about that. What kind of vehicle do you have to spread it with? Um, does it have a variable speed on it? Do you want that? Is that important to you? Um, spreading and shredding. That was a, that were a couple of words used in all of their marketing where um, what kind of spreading and shredding does it do? And is that important? And it's going to depend on the type of bedding that you're using. Okay. So bushels per ton of manure, holy smokes. So we talked about tons and we talked about cubic feet and then some people when they sell manure haulers or manure spreaders are selling them on a bushel basis. So how many bushels of manure can they hold? And so if you go through all of these calculations, you can figure out that 26 bushels per ton of manure. That's uh, so where for every ton of manure, you're gonna have 26 bushels. So again, this is just important for when you're um, talking to either that custom hauler or you're talking to that sales rep when you're going to purchase one of these um, at home spreaders. Here's some options here. This is what they look like. You just need to know um, that so the black one is actually in cubic, it's a volume, so cubic feet, whereas the other ones were um, marketed on a bushel basis. So none is better than the other. It's just important for you to know how to do that. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up here pretty quick. I'm just going to cruise through these ones. So, manure sampling information. I think before you spread ever, you should always sample your manure. I think for me, it's one of the most important things I can tell you. So sample your manure. Um, these are some labs that we use here in North Dakota. Um, these labs are located elsewhere. So there's some North Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota on here. Um, you can use any lab that you would like to. These are just the ones here locally that we use. And then of course, once you get that, those results back, so what's your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, what are those results from your nutrient analysis that you did? And those tests can cost anywhere from $40 to $100, just depending on what you're looking for. Um, then I want you to calibrate your spreader. So you're going to go through how many tons of manure per acre is being applied. So here I am back to talking about tons of manure per acre. And we have a publication that I'll put up in the resources part uh, with this webinar when I post it that I'll talk about. It's actually this publication here, Manure Spreader Calibration. And it has this this uh, chart inside of it. And so it'll talk and literally walk you through, these are pictures directly from the publication that'll walk you through how to calibrate your spreader. Now you might look at this and say, that is a huge tractor and I'm gonna be using an ATV. That's okay, you, it's the same concept. Doesn't matter if it's a, you're going tons per acre, or you're going pounds, it doesn't matter how big your units are, we still wanna calibrate and know what we're putting down. Okay, and then one of the last things is just using manure. So in North Dakota, there's no restrictions as far as when we can spread. Some states, there's a, you, they cut off the time, so like you can't spread from November to April. Um, in North Dakota, we don't have that, but we do, of course, um, we can spread on frozen ground, but we want to make sure that the runoff is contained and um, it does not have the potential to run off in the spring. And then also we want to consider slopes with less than 6%, uh, vegetative cover, stubble, and less than eight inches of snow. So that's if you're going to be spreading in the winter. Otherwise, we just want to use common sense, really. Um, we have, we all have these handy little smartphones. Oh, you can't see it. There we go. We all have these handy little smartphones and they have weather apps on them. And you can go almost to the minute in some of them, for sure, by the hour. So you know if it's going to rain. You know if there's a big event coming. Don't spread because you're potentially going to compromise our water quality issues. Uh, and then that's where we run into issues. Okay. 
Manure contains valuable nutrients. We talked about that a little bit earlier today. How much manure are your horses producing per year? Um, and that's important to know if you're gonna be working with a custom hauler, it's important to know if you're gonna buy something, if you're gonna be spreading yourself, if you're looking for a stacking area. So you need to know what you're producing, how you plan a management, and where will you store it or where will you spread it? All things to keep in mind when you're either working with yourself on your nutrient management plan or you're working with a custom person coming in and doing that with you. Uh, composting potentially can reduce the weed seeds, the pathogens, the total volume if you manage that properly with a temp and turning. Mechanical, cultural, and chemical um, are all control methods for managing weed seeds. Proper manure management can reduce uh, parasite load. And then of course, just use common sense when we're spreading our manure. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop. Um, that's it, that's all I have. So I think we're gonna open it up and see if we have any questions. Okay, so I was going to go over the kind of Q&A what we've had already. Um, if, any, if everybody was paying attention to Mary, that you may not have seen the Q&A. So Laura said that she couldn't afford a new manure spreader. Do you have any suggestions as to where I can find a used spreader? Does the extension office have a buy sell trade website or is it good to look on Craigslist or Facebook? And Paige had mentioned um, in North Dakota we use it, we find used equipment commonly posted on Bizman Online or you can look in the classified section of the ag papers such as Ag Week and the Farm and Ranch Guide. Okay, yes, that's great. And then Gretchen said she, uh, the barn that she's at piles manure throughout the pasture area in the winter and spreads it in the spring. Horses are not in the pasture 24 seven and they have free access to hay that they enjoy over grass, which is rather sparse. However, she was curious if this is potentially not a good idea. So Paige mentioned that ideally the stockpiled manure should be composted before spreading in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then we have a couple of open questions yet. Chris asks, how much can we put down of the composted horse manure on gardens, between trees, etc.? So if, uh, if one of my extension agents is more comfortable answering this question, I certainly welcome either uh, Rachel or Paige to do that. Um, I, of course, uh, coming from the manure side of things, will tell you only put down what you need. Uh, and what do you need? Depends on what you're growing and the situation in your garden. Um, so Rachel, did you have anything to follow up on? Yep. Yep. Um, like Mary had said, get your manure tested so that you know what's there. Um, and then make sure you don't overdo it. Um, a lot of the times trees don't necessarily need any extra nutrients unless they're struggling with something. Um, and then gardens, absolutely. You can put down composted manure in there, but make sure it's not too much. Um, I know, I think it was Mary actually had told me that you guys had used it on your gardens and you, you were good for like 20 years because <laughs> you had so much in there. So, you know, you can use it um, and you can use it. You don't need to use all of it is what I'm saying. Um, you know, get your, get your compost emitter tested to find out how much is there. Test your garden plots to see what's a, what you already have available and then put down for what you need. Ideally, you'd want a soil sample and a manure sample, and then we could calculate the correct rate to apply. Mm -hmm. um, quickly, before we go to the next question, if you guys do have, um, if you see the poll up on your screen, I'd really appreciate if you'd answer that. That one helps us know whether or not these are useful and if we should keep doing them. Uh, so if you can just click and answer quick, I'm going to turn this off in about five seconds. And then, and then we have some other ones that, of course, we think are more important than this question, which is, should we do another one of these? Uh, and so as soon as you're done answering this one, I'll bring the next one up. And Rachel, let's keep rolling through questions. Okay, so Lori says, do composter, compost turners come in small size? And what is an idea of cost range? You know, I am most familiar with the bigger ones, um, the, so the kinds that, that we saw, and those cost ranges are 30 to 70 grand. Uh, so that's a lot. Um, and that's why I say like, uh, it's good for a community project. Now, are there smaller ones? I'm almost positive that somebody has marketed or engineered a smaller compost turner. Um, but at, at some point, and I know this cause I've actually, I've seen a few smaller ones, especially in barns. 
Um, so when they do um, like in barn composting, um, most common in dairy industries, they're a smaller unit, they're hooked up behind a tractor. Um, so it's, it's a little different setup. And so there are some other options there. Um, so we would have to look at some of that. But yeah, mostly they're, they're bigger. And they, the, the thing with compost turners is they require a creeper gear, so a very slow gear so that we don't burn out our clutch. And that's the biggest deal is that we want to make sure um, it's not just the turner expense, it's the tractor expense as well. So I don't want to turn you off the composting. I think it's an awesome process, but we just have a lot of things to look at when we're doing that. And I'd like to add that work with what you have. I know Mary mentioned that earlier, but um, a little bit of composting with a small skid steer or even by hand is, is still doable. So don't let the cost of the commercial grade equipment uh, turn you away and thinking you can't compost. Yes. And Rachel, I think you're muted. Sorry, the next one is from Robin. Does straw bedding compost harder than shavings? Um, in the compost process? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to depend on what you have available to you. So if you're using a, a fork, um, probably yes. If you're, you know, just using a pitchfork or, you know, something smaller, depends on if you're getting that up to a heat. So if you're really heating that product up well, um, you have the correct ratios that we talked about earlier with carbon to nitrogen and moisture, um, those things, uh, it might go away a little easier. Um, but the, so in those instances, if you're using smaller um, equipment, wood chips are going to be easier. Wood chips and horsemen are easy. Uh, straw, it takes a little bit. Straw goes away, I think, a little easier with a, a turner. And you don't have to, um, you don't have to spread composted manure. You can spread raw manure too. There's a lot of people that if you have an at-home system, you're going to pitch your manure daily or weekly into that little unit and you're going to go spread it and that's okay. You can spread raw manure um, and these units that I showed you are set up to do straw. Um, so they're not just for horse folks, they're for, you know, if you have a smaller sheep operation or a smaller beef operation, uh, you can use those turners there as well. And so um, straw is something that we can put through a spreader. Okay, Robin says thank you. Uh, the next one is from Judy. We have a plastic covered pile for three years. Still okay to use? I'd say it's still okay to use. It's still a product, uh, still a good product. Um, it might be, depending on the heat, uh, where you're located, um, it, you may have sterilized a certain part of that, like the top few inches of that product. Um, if it was covered, you know, with a black plastic and it's really warm outside. And so if you're looking at it for, um, you're thinking, I'm going to get a ton of microbial activity in this product and I'm going to use it for that reason. Maybe not, but nutrient wise, you're still good. Okay. Laura has the next question. She's wondering if the questions that we've asked here are going to be available to read through after all the presentations are done. Well, Laura, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure because this is the first time we've used the actual webinar version of this. And so um, we've, used, we've used Zoom before, but this is a different platform inside Zoom. So I think yes, but we'll have to see. Okay, the next one is from Jeff. Any cost studies on building a covered pavement set up for five horses? Boy, I bet there are. I would have to do a little bit of research on that one. I'm thinking that that is something that we could probably easily get for you. Mm -hmm. I think it would vary by region too and what materials you want to use. So is it a concrete bunker? Yes. Um, is it just going to be on a hard clay pan? Um, it would vary, but yeah, we could find some resources. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now the next one is from Lori. We have found have you found, sorry, that any chemical residue exists when you use commercial wood shavings or bedding? I'm asking from the shavings side of things. I can handle that one. I, I don't believe so from the shavings. The concern would be any hay that you were feeding your horses and that was wasted and trampled into the manure and bedding. Um, that that hay would be the concern for residue. And when you're purchasing hay, you really don't know if it's been sprayed or not. Yes. 
Okay, that was all for the Q&A right now. If anybody does have a question yet, please pop that into the Q&A box so we can address it. And this is our last poll. Uh, we didn't want to poll you to death, and so we, we thought these four were the most important questions that we could ask. And so this is the last poll. So if you haven't answered yet and want to do that, we would appreciate it. Uh, it looks like from the, the results of the last poll that you guys would be interested in another one of these and uh, grazing, grazing management would be the next topic. If there are any other topics that you're interested in, please feel free to put those in the chat box. We just threw a couple up there that were potential topics, but we are open to others. Yes. And we did have an answered question in the chat pod um, or the Q&A earlier. Um, Laura said earlier in the presentation, you mentioned to pick the pastures once a week. Is spreading the manure throughout the pasture a viable option? We usually take a drag behind the four-wheeler and drag the pasture to even out the manure piles. Is that sufficient? Paige answered that with, ideally, we would want to compost the manure to kill weeds, seeds, pathogens, and stabilize any nutrients before dragging. Oh, and we have one more in the Q&A. Robin Barnes. Uh, Oh, she says she likes all of the topics, but it only lets you pick one. <laughs> I know, I did that on purpose. Um, and so we, we talked about that too. And I think Rachel and Paige were like, are you sure only one? And I'm like, yes, because I want to know what's next. And then we'll do it again. And then we'll ask that question again. Uh, so yes, we, we know that all of those are pretty important to you guys. And I think we've got a couple in the chat pod um, that uh, Courtney says she would love something on arena footing and management. Okay. Kelly says horse owner, barn over, owner, uh, Mindy on worming and vaccinations. And I think we kind of were thinking about that in, in the industry side of things, the veterinary service and the, and, and the feed sales. Um, and then Jeff was wondering about building a sacrifice area or, and cleaning that area. Yes, and that is something that's pretty commonly done too. Uh, I think in the, the horse industry is um, sacrificing a piece of land, as in we know that it, basically it's like a, a manure stacking area, but you don't stack your manure there. You just know that those animals are going to be there. There's going to be no grass growing, uh, hopefully no weeds either. Um, it's just going to be an area where the animals stand um, and it, it's black. And so that would be in sacrifice area and then cleaning that out, we would clean that manure out of there um, for all the issues we talked about today and then use a stacking area for that. Oh, and John, John put a good one in the chat box that said, I'm interested in how to judge hay quality. Oh. That, that might be another thing where um, testing is always good. Um, you can, you can have your hay tested, send it into the lab to find out the nutrient sample and then there's always places online um, that you can find the nutrients that your horse would need. Uh, kind of as an example would be Merck Veterinary Manual has a really good layout of age range of horses and type of horse and, and all of that as well. Um, or talking to your local extension agent. Uh, mud management in the Red River Valley is another topic. Okay. So I am going to wrap this up because we're just a little bit over one and I want to make sure that everybody has time to go on to either their next meeting or their homeschooling session or back to work or whatever we have going on in this crazy world. So we just really appreciate everybody being here today. If you do have follow-up questions, if we said something today and you're just going to need a, a minute to think about it, you can always mull that over and then send me an email. Uh, so mary.kina ndsu.edu, my email address is up on the screen. And so um, send us an email. And then um, I have the list of attendees for today. And so I will send out, once we have the, the webinar posted, I'll send out an email that has uh, the link. So the link that's here will be the same link that's in that email so that you can get that. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions for either Paige or Rachel, let me know and I can always forward that to them. So send it to me and I'll get it to them. And with that, I think we will end. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.